following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good to see you as we continue in this season of anticipation and expectation as we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of our Lord Jesus. Let us go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this season. The season in which there is an air of expectancy, an air of anticipation, yes, even an air of joy, because we feel that the fulfillment of your promises are coming close. And Lord, we just thank you for what this season means. We ask that Jesus, he who is Emmanuel, God with us, would be very present as we look into your word this morning, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, You would lead and guide our thoughts and our minds and our hearts and help us, O God, to apply this word to our lives and to become the disciples you're calling us to be. For we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Ah, cows. Cows. Don't you just love cows? They're big, lumbering, earthbound beasts, right? Well, a couple of years ago, a video of a bunch of dairy cows was making its rounds on the internet. With their milking days behind them, these dairy cows had been headed to the slaughterhouse, but an animal welfare group stepped in to offer the cows a retirement home. (laughs) And in the video, you see these animals relishing their release from their winter housing into the great outdoors at this retirement home, and it appears that they were literally jumping for joy. But were they? Well, on NPR, there was a whole story about this. And a Canadian cow behavior researcher, yes, there's people that do this, <laughs> experts in cow behavior, responded, can it be joy? Who knows how to identify joy in cows? What we do know is that cows love a change of scenery. In fact, she continued, cows are suckers for novelty. They get an extra leap in their step whenever something new or unexpected happens. And happy cows can really catch some air. A young cow can easily clear a five-foot fence. So what about you? What would make you literally jump for joy? What would make you jump up and down and throw your hat into the air? I think about pictures when the end of World War II was announced. There's jubilation in the street. People are kissing strangers. They're throwing their hats in the air and they're leaping for joy. I remember the same kind of scene when the Berlin Wall came down. 1989, there was unbridled jubilation, leaping for joy. Perhaps if you won the lottery, even though it's against the United Methodist Social Principles, maybe if you won the lottery, (laughs) you would leap for joy. Maybe you get the news that you're cancer-free, and that would cause you to leap for joy. You see, when war ends and tyrannies topple, when prosperity comes and sickness goes, that's good news, news that might cause us to leap for joy. In our text for today, that's the kind of good news that Mary and Elizabeth celebrate together. It's the good news that the kingdom of God, the government of God, the reign and the rule of God is at last breaking into the world. And the story goes like this. There was an elderly Jewish couple, a priest and his wife named Zachariah and Elizabeth. In their youth, Zach and Elizabeth had prayed for children, but children did not come. And now they're old, well past childbearing age. But an angel comes to Zechariah as he offers incense upon the altar in the temple and tells Zechariah that his wife is going to become pregnant. She's going to bear a son, and this son will be great and mighty in the Lord's sight. He'll come in the spirit and the power of the prophet Elijah. His name will be called John, and he will prepare the way of the Lord. Well, six months later, this same angel Gabriel was sent to a little backwater village called Vindex, I mean Nazareth, and he came to this young teenage girl to announce to her that though she was a virgin, she was going to conceive in her womb, and she was going to give birth to a child. His name would be Jesus, and he would deliver his people. This is how the story begins. And after having this angelic announcement, Mary is overshadowed by the Spirit. And just as the angel said, a child is conceived in her. So hurriedly, Mary leaves. She she leaves her village in Nazareth and she travels 70 miles south 
into the Judean hill country to spend a few months with her older cousin Elizabeth. After all, the angel had told Mary that Elizabeth was also with child. Well, after the arduous journey, Mary arrives at Zechariah and Elizabeth's home. She enters into the house, and when she sees her cousin Elizabeth, Mary greets her in the traditional Jewish way. Shalom, she says. Shalom, peace. And at that moment, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she shouts out, Blessed are you among women, Mary, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how is it, how is it that the mother of my Lord has come to visit me? Wow, strange things are happening. Strange things indeed. Well, at the same time that Elizabeth gives this unusual greeting to her young cousin Mary, the baby inside Elizabeth's womb experienced something. That baby inside Elizabeth's womb experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this baby, who is just six months in gestation, begins to leap for joy within Elizabeth. This is the leaping Baptist. This is John the Baptist, the first of all the Baptists. And when he hears Mary's voice, that Baptist is just jumping up and down, leaping for joy. You see, when joy comes, we can't sit still. We want to get up and dance. Whenever we start to notice God's amazing transformative work, it makes us want to leap. And that's what John does even as a six-month-old fetus. So what we have here, what we have here are two pregnant women neither of whom, according to their circumstances, should be or could be pregnant. One is too old, one is too young, one is barren, one is a virgin, yet both are pregnant. We have an old woman who's going to give birth to a son who will bring the old age, the Old Testament period to a close. At the same time, we have a young woman who's going to give birth to a son who will open up the new age. And these two women are meeting and they are rejoicing together. And when Elizabeth brings forth her extraordinary greeting, after John the Baptist leaps within his mother's womb, that same spirit then comes upon Mary. And Mary brings forth a prophetic song. The song is actually an ad adaptation Bits are borrowed from the songs of Moses and Miriam and Deborah and Hannah, all these Old Testament songs. But it is a song about God, and it is a song about revolution. It is a song about God injecting himself into the world in such a way that things are turned on their head. They are revolutionized. It's not just an innocent, building ballad. It is a protest song. In fact, one scholar compares it to hip-hop, so we can think of Mary the hip-hop artist, right? <laughs> It should be done with a stomp, with a stomp. And it goes like this. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked with favor on His lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. He has shown mercy on those who fear Him in every generation. He has shown the strength of His arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones, and He has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich He has sent away empty. He has come to the help of Israel, His servant, for He has remembered His promise of mercy the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his children forever. Wow, quite a song. It's quite a song. And here are two Jewish women, both poor and oppressed, both living in a land that's occupied by a foreign superpower. But even though they belong to this oppressed nation, they're suddenly overflowing with joy. They're overflowing with joy because they believe that something big is about to happen. And what is this big thing? They believe that God is about to act in such a way as to launch a revolution. God's going to launch a revolution. And what's amazing is they believe that God's going to launch this revolution through their two sons. They're both pregnant in improb improbable ways. They both have sons about to be born six months apart. And they believe... They dare to believe that God is going to launch a revolution through these two sons. This coming revolution is in fact the kingdom of God. It's the coming of God's way of running the world. And God's way of running the world is going to come onto the world stage through these two boys. Born through these two improbable women. Here they are. 
in this little Judean hilltop town prophesying and rejoicing. And of course, the whole scene is absurd. Two unlikely pregnant women living in poverty here in an obscure, out-of-the-way corner of the world prophesying that the world is about to be radically changed through their soon-to-be-born babies. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. It's crazy. And it's true. So true that it even makes the Baptist baby inside Elizabeth leap for joy. You see, Mary and Elizabeth live in a world run by the ruthless and the strong. Augustus Caesar sits on his imperial throne in Rome. Herod the Great sits on his throne in Jerusalem. These are brutal tyrants who run the world the way they want to their own advantage. But Mary, Mary, this little 14-year-old revolutionary, believes that God is about to act and establish a new way of running the world, a way that will put the bullies out of business and give the meek a chance. See, Mary prophesies in the long tradition of the Hebrew prophets. The Old Testament prophets looked around the world. They saw, and they saw what was wrong with the world. They saw how it didn't match up with God's intention. And then the prophets would use subversive poetry to describe what's wrong. But they would also offer an imagination. You see, they didn't just say, this is what's wrong. But they also offered a vision of what it would be like when God acts. A vision of what it would be like when God intervenes. When God turns injustice into justice. When God flips the tables and puts the brutal bullies and tyrants out of business. And when God gives those on the ash heaps of society a chance. That's Amos and Obadiah and Nahum and Habakkuk. That's Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea. That's the Old Testament Hebrew prophets. And you see, prophecy is not primarily the prediction of future events. We often think of it as that way. But prophecy is not primarily about the prediction of future events. No, prophecy is mainly the critique of present structures with an alternative imagination for the future. It's a critique of the present world with a vision of what the future would be like. This is what's wrong, the prophets say, and here's an idea, here's a vision of how God will set it right. As such, prophecy comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Prophecy comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Imagine today, 2018, someone on the world stage says, everything is about to change radically. We're going to flip it all around. Those on top are going to be on the bottom. Those on bottom are going to be on top. The first are going to be last, and last are going to be first. It's going to be wholesale change all across the globe. And if you're in some place like, say, I don't know, Bangladesh, how do you hear that? Woohoo! Rock on! I like this prophet. He's saying what I want to hear. Let's flip it around. Let's get started. I'm ready to be on top. You see, if you're on bottom, you hear this announcement, it's comforting. There is going to be change, and you're finally going to have a chance. But but if you're someplace else, someplace where the current status quo is advantageous to you, and you hear this prophet say something like this, how would you respond? Well, you know, let's not, let's not get carried away here. We might need to tweak a few things, but this business about last, first, first, last, bottom, top, top, bottom, I don't know about all that. Status quo is good for you, you would find this announcement troubling. Because prophet comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. That's why John leaps. But others resist Mary's revolutionary message. Mary's prophecy concerns the reign of God that her son will bring to the world. And when that happens, the proud, the powerful, and the rich will not be given their accustomed positions of privilege. The proud, the powerful, the rich, they're used to being in charge. They're used to setting the rules for the game. Have you ever been learning a game, maybe a board game or someone's teaching you a card game or something like that, and you get this suspicion that they're making up the rules for their own advantage? (laughs) I've been there. Sometimes the whole world is arranged that way. The proud, the powerful, and the rich arrange the whole thing so that no matter what, they always win. But in Mary's prophecy, in Mary's prophecy, the proud, the powerful, and the rich are not given their accustomed position of privilege. And when Jesus' ministry begins, some 30 years later, who are the ones who actually oppose him? Who are the ones who oppose Jesus? It is the proud, the powerful, 
and the rich. The proud Pharisees with their arrogant certitude. They said, we're the ones who know the Bible. We're the ones who know who are right with God. We're the ones who can tell you who's in and who's out. And we're in and they're out. And in their pride, the Pharisees opposed Jesus. Then there were the powerful, the powerful Sadducees. These were the priestly class, the ones that ran the temple. And they saw the temple not as a center of worship, which it was called to be, but as a center of power, their power. And why did the Sadducees fight against Jesus? Because he protested against their temple. And finally, there were the rich Herodians. The Herodians were the rich people of the day. They were the ones for whom the present arrangement of the world was very advantageous. They were able to take advantage of all the poor people. And they believed very much in obtaining this and maintaining the status quo. And thus they also joined in the fight against Jesus. So you had the proud, the powerful, and the rich all opposing Jesus. On the other hand, who were the ones who flocked to Jesus? Who were the ones who hung on Jesus' every word? Who were the ones that followed him? The lepers, the sick, the poor, the moral outcasts, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, the one who had been on bottom, left out, shunned. They're the ones that are drawing near to Jesus. Do you see the great reversal that is occurring? A new kingdom, a new government is coming. The proud, the powerful, and the rich, they want to keep the world the way it is, and they are falling. And all of a sudden, the ones that have always been on the bottom are being lifted up. The poor are being lifted up. The sick are being lifted up. The outcasts are being raised up. It, and it's these people, the humble and the hungry, that Jesus also blesses in the introduction of his great sermon when he gets to preaching. He starts this way, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those that mourn, the meek, the hungry, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, the persecuted. In other words, Mary's song and Jesus' beatitudes are saying the same thing. Mary's song and Jesus' beatitudes are blessing the same kind of people. And they mark a seismic shift in world history. And you're like, okay, that's good news, great stuff, thanks for sharing. What are we to make about all this? How do we apply this to our life? We could put it this way. We could put it this way. God's grace, God's grace flows downhill towards the low places of our lives. God's grace flows downhill towards the low places of our lives, the places where we are humble, where we are weak, where we are poor. And we desperately need a Christianity informed by Mary's prophetic song. Because in America, we're naturally inclined toward ideologies of success and anthems of grace. The grace of God does not flow uphill towards the pinnacles of success and strength. The grace of God flows downhill to the places of humility and trust and weakness. So you might have some areas of your life. You might have areas of your life where you are strong and successful and rich. That's good. Good. Not wrong. But the message today would be be careful. Be careful because those are our danger areas. The areas where we're strong and successful and rich, that's where pride can come in and it can put us in the position of the great reversal. And though it, it's not wrong to have areas in your life in which you're strong, successful, and rich, those are not the areas where the grace of God is going to flow because the grace of God does not flow uphill to the pinnacles of strength and success. No. The grace of God flows downhill to the areas of our weakness, of our poverty, of our failure, of our brokenness, of our insufficiency, of our sorrow, of our sin. That's what the Apostle Paul taught us. The Apostle Paul said that the grace of God is made perfect in what? In strength? In success? No. He said the grace of God is made perfect in weakness. The grace of God is made perfect in weakness. So it's the areas where we're low, where we're on the ash heap, where we're broken, where we're beaten down, where we're defeated, where we're hopeless, helpless and poor. Those are the areas, those are the places where we will encounter the grace of God because the grace of God flows downhill, not uphill. 
And so I invite you this morning to think about your own life, to identify some place, some area of your life, somewhere where you're weak, poor, insufficient, failing. Maybe it's an era, area of sorrow, of, of sin, of poverty, of, of weakness, of, of brokenness. And if you can't think of anything, wow, I'm amazed. God bless you. But as you think about that area, hear the good news. Believe the good news that Mary prophesied. The, the good news that made the Baptist leap for joy. The good news that, that Jesus proclaimed. That good news is, is that where we are poor, where we are mourning, where we are hungry, where we are persecuted, into those areas God's blessings flow. Into those areas God's grace comes. And through God's grace, somehow, in a mysterious way, weakness becomes strength. Poverty is turned into wealth. Those who are down are being lifted up. Those who have been outcast are being drawn right in. Those pushed away are, are being brought close. God's grace is flowing. God's grace is moving downhill, and it is flowing over you this morning. That's the good news. And it's enough to even make a Baptist and a Methodist leap for joy. Amen. Our Father, we thank you today for the good news. The good news that Mary sang. The good news that made John the Baptist leap for joy. The good news that your kingdom, your reign is coming. And we thank you that it came in the person of Jesus Christ. And Mary's song in the ministry of Jesus reminds us this morning that your grace flows downhill. Your grace flows into those areas where we are broken, where we are sorrowful, where we are, are mourning, God. Into those areas where we are, are sinful and those areas where we are weak and, and, and helpless, Lord. It's into those areas that your grace comes and we thank you, God, for that great reversal that in the midst of weakness, Lord, you are bringing your strength. In the midst, Lord, of our sorrow, Lord, you are bringing your joy. And we thank you, God, for that. And we confess that sometimes we, we have some tendencies to sometimes be among the, the proud, Lord. And, and we want to be in, uh, among the powerful. And, Lord, we, we confess that sometimes, Lord, we have, have wanted to maintain the status quo in order to, to keep the advantage going to us. We're reminded today, Lord, that in the midst of all of our successes and strengths, that, Lord, it's in our weaknesses that you actually bring your grace. And so, Lord, where we are broken this morning, I ask that you will come and make us whole. Where we are mourning, God, just bring, bring your peace into the midst of our sorrow. Lord, whatever need we have, where there is sinfulness, bring your forgiveness. Lord, whatever it is, we thank you this morning that your grace is here. And we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. That's our prayer this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, let your grace flow over us. Let your grace flow into our lives and into the weak places. Lord, we thank you this morning for the good news that your grace flows downhill. In Jesus' name, amen. We read the story of honor and glory and praise the name of the preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.